I think I, I, I do remember us talking about this. I did get one of the gigantic Easter Island heads sent to my American oh, flag. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's great! I tell you, it was it was it was the it was an excellent like roast or whatever. Like it was, we were on tour. It was a guy who used to tour manage me. He's now tour manager Flog and Molly, and we were touring oh, nice. with Flog and Molly. And you know, he has a busy time tour managing that band. And mm -hmm. the last day of the tour is always hectic because, as a tour manager, part of his job is to deal with where all the equipment goes after the last show. Do you know what I mean? And as well as yeah. where all the people go. Um, so I had a eight foot tall Easter Island head shipped to the final venue of the tour addressed to him <laughs> um, with no further explanation. Tokyo tonight. Tonight. Hello. Hey. Hello. How are you? Look at that. I'm very well. I'm very pleased. Am, am I your first repeat guest? You're not our first repeat guest. Damn it. Um, well then. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Thanks. Very much. Bye. <laughs> I I'm wanted out. to lie to you. I really did. I you said it, and I was like, oh, I should just tell. no. But you're not our first repeat guest. You are. But you're our first guest ever on the show. You agreed to come on before. Okay. Anybody... All right. Well. Yeah, yeah that, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, I feel like, so I, I was genuinely, so when I, when I asked you to come on the show, like we decided to do the podcast, we were going to do it. And then I was like, I think I had messaged you or just something out of the blue and you had actually gotten back to me. And I was like, oh, I'm like, mm. I'm going to ask him, I'm going to ask him to do the show. And then you did. And I was like, I don't know if I should tell him he's the first. <laughs> I feel back. I, I'm pretty sure. I mean, you know, it went well. Yeah. We had a good time. Oh yeah, we had a blast. Yeah, yeah it was awesome. Um, is this your first? You've been touring for a little bit at this point now, right? Like this is your yeah. first time back in the U.S. But yeah, well, actually, funnily enough, it's not even that. We um, we hmm. did a, I did a tour in the states in October last year. Um, oh nice. Which increasingly feels like a kind of weird fever dream. Um, uh, <laughs> like it was it was really early doors to be back on the road again, post everything and i had a run of shows with cat and crows which was awesome That's right. um uh kind of a dream for me actually and indeed a couple of festivals and some headline shows and all this kind of thing but like it, it was that was a strange time to be on the road um and that that was a duo tour it was me and matt who plays um madeline yeah yeah when we do a duo show so we did that um and 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 it was cool and it was sort of it, it felt good to sort of trying to be on the front foot but like the temperature of arguments about things like testing and COVID passes and vaccines and everything was was yet higher back then Oof. than it is now, oh, yeah. um, and which made it quite stressful touring back then. I mean, I always feel like it's important to say, like, contrary to what what uh, Joe Public may think and and be keen to let me know about all on my social media and email and all the rest of it, things are not just back to normal no. in the music industry. Yeah, right. and it's like everyone's kind of like, well, there are no restrictions where I live now, so why isn't everything exactly like it was two and a half years ago? And it's like, well, <laughs> um, as an yeah. industry, we got kicked in the groin every single day for two and a half years, and uh, it sucked. And it's going to take a while to uh, to stand up again after that. But we're on tour. I've got my band. Um, I've got uh, the Bronx, Pat Needs with us. Uh, we're in Richmond, Virginia. Who could complain? But right. right. <laughs> no, I, I hear you, man. And it, <clears throat> it's weird, too, because even like comedy wise and stuff like that, going back out, like the audience has such a different perception of what is going on, because to them, sure. every they like everybody has to go back out to normal. Like, that's the thing I feel like is weird is that, you know, we were basically forced back out into norm, you know, quote unquote, whatever normal is. Right. Um, and uh, and I don't think anybody really kind of knows what's right and what's like what like. You know, I don't want anybody to get sick, but I also know that people are going out in droves anyway, and you're either sure. going to go along with it and try to be as safe as you possibly can, or you don't go out at all anymore. Right. And well, and like, ultimately, you know, the, the, the great difficulty is that part of the job of being a live entertainer is the job of gathering large numbers of people together. But yeah. you reach a point where it's like everyone's going to the mall and everybody's yeah. going to the airports and train stations and all the rest of it. And it's like, ultimately... Cat, I wouldn't be careful in how I phrase this, but there are sort of moments where it's a bit kind of like you're still trying to be the good person, do the right thing, and thereby 
just repeatedly blowing up any hope of like yes. making a living, your savings, yep. your career, just yeah. smashing it in the knees with a tire iron day <laughs> after day after day. Well, everybody else is just kind of carrying on. Yeah. You should have reached a point. It's like, do I have to keep doing this? Yeah. Like, um, and, mm -hmm. and ultimately no. And, 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 you know, we have to collectively reach a point where, you know, there's an acceptance of personal responsibility and, and risk yeah. and all this kind of thing, you know, and it's not like, People didn't tour during flu season in the past and all the, re the rest. Not that I'm saying that COVID and flu are the same. No, I hear you. Not. But, you know, so it's, 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 been, it's been really hard, you know, and I, there's a large part of me that feels like those of us in the live entertainment industry have been kind of like canaries in a coal mine in a way that's been kind of unfair. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> it's totally. Like, we started to get shouted at. Again, like when things were first kicking off, I just got so, I got people emailing me telling me I was a murderer for not canceling tour dates when the first cases were reported in China and stuff. And it was just like, yeah. I don't know what to do with that information. No, I know. Um, <laughs> and then, and then, but then and on the flip side of it, as I say, now we get the situation where it was like, well, why isn't everything completely normal? And it's just kind of like, because everything was blown up. It's yeah. Like, I mean, it's like, like it's been complete and utter chaotic devastation for more than two years and it's right. like so no we didn't just flick a switch i mean damn yeah but i don't I, but once again i've done it again i'm complaining i don't want to complain no I you're fine no those. i mean i i <laughs> i'm i'm happy no you're not complaining at all and i'm kind of happy like we, we've talked about this with other guests and stuff like that on the show i think it's nice to get a perspective from you know because you're not being malicious about it you're not being crass sure. about it or rude about it you're just expressing obvious concerns that i think a lot of people kind of have like even like sure. i like the other day it was one of those things where like so i um you know we had robert klein on the show and then he was performing somewhere in new jersey so he invited me out and i went to go see him and in the back of my mind the entire time i'm like i know this guy has avoided covid i know i don't have it right now but you know like you're in the theater you're with people i know i'm hanging out with him afterward but i'm like god what if i'm the one who kills him you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like I was like, because well, now yeah. there's a photo of us, and I'm younger, and I'm just like, what? You know what I mean? It, like, yeah, yeah. Well, I think then, okay. So, so check this out. Like, in terms of like the, the universal god, or however you want to put it, like mm -hmm. screwing with my life. Like, if if my life recently was like a was a film script, and it would be like something like The Office. Do you know what I mean? Like one of those like. <laughs> humiliation comedies <laughs> right the, the universe threw, threw me like a, a, a curveball so we're, we're more than two years into a global pandemic and during that period of time i hadn't had covid mm -hmm. until two weeks before this fucking tour started oh, wow and it was just like i couldn't fucking believe it i was yeah. excuse my swearing i was at home mm -hmm. uh, and like and i was in the middle of like i was trying to sort of like you know sort of eat right, sort of work out a bit, get my voice in shape, sort of get ready. This is a huge undertaking. We're playing 50 states in 50 days. Yeah. And it was like, need to be in shape. And then I started feeling a bit weird. And then I did a test and it was just like, you have to be fucking with me at this point. Wow. Um, no. And then, cause then the problem with it is, I mean, obviously I was sick for a time, mm -hmm. which was unpleasant. Yeah. And it's a respiratory tract infection, which isn't great as a singer. Right. Um, uh, and also, whilst having fever, I managed to throw my back out for the first time in four years. Oh, so, wow. um, so about five days before the tour was due to start, I was in England. <laughs> Couldn't get into the US because you still had to like get a negative test on the plane. Not that I would have gotten a plane if I had COVID anyway. Right. Um, yeah. And I couldn't really sing or stand up. And it was just like, hmm. Well, this isn't quite how I was planning on this going. Um, and we like delayed the rest of my crew flew out and like we were putting together a plan B, but it was just sort of too horrendous to contemplate how much because we, you know, we've set ourselves a time period to play 50 states and we can't very easily yeah. kind of scoot stuff around within that period. Right. So, right. Um, and then finally, like literally the day before I was, well, the day I was originally supposed to fly, I had like, I did a test that was incredibly faint and I was feeling better and it was nice. just like, huh okay um and then so we pushed my flight back as late as possible and then that morning i got up and had a negative test and i was like ah and it was just, <laughs> then, then then i did like 10 more tests in a row just like ah, ah, ah. right um, and, and, uh, <laughs> and was definitely did not have COVID. and it was like okay i can get on the plane now now of course like i'm exhausted <laughs> yeah like, yeah uh don't have any acclimatization time for time zones like my throat was still a bit kind of screwed it was just like this is gonna be an interesting start to this tour and it's not like i have any respite for right. 50 days but you know, um, uh, we're now we're eleven shows down, 
um and you know we've everything has actually gone ahead and run like clockwork and all the rest and awesome that's um, great man you look good thank well thank you very much um yep. and i had a day off yesterday i slept for 13 hours oh, oh wow. nice that yeah, well, i i got i got it uh the same thing happened to me where i was super careful did not get it like two months ago now, I think I'm running out of the 90 day, you know, uh, immunity that I've got where I can basically lick doorknobs and shit, apparently. Oh, yeah, that's um, that's that's where I'm at at the moment. But it's, yeah, it's yeah. Just where like, you're just I'm like mouth kissing strangers. And... <laughs> <laughs> you're doing that fleet week thing in New York where you're just dipping women that you don't even know. And they're like, stop doing that. Uh, you're like, should I be my whites? Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was, it, I got it. And I and I was down for like three days, but I did. I slept for an entire day. Like, yeah. and I didn't even decide to do it. My body was like, we're, sh we're shutting you down. <laughs> and I just yeah, you know, that's, that's very much what I feel like I've been needing to do, but obviously yeah. the schedule hasn't really allowed for that. But, you know, I mean, uh, it feels very in keeping with the 2020s. Oh yeah. 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 It's a down, it's a weird downward spiral thing. Um, do you, I got to ask you about the, the, you on tour with the counting crows. Cause a long time ago, I love the counting crows. They're one of my all time favorite bands and you're up there with them singer songwriters the whole thing but i want to say i'm not even blowing smoke because it was like when i found out that i read an article where you were talking about how uh kind of what you learned to play guitar with or what you used to listen to and yeah, and, yeah. and one of them was uh counting crows and then you would talked yeah. about how their lyrics kind of inspired like adam's lyrics and all that stuff and then uh i saw you were going out on tour with them but the cool thing was is i liked you guys separately like i just found you and then started listening to your stuff and i was like oh my god this guy's fucking great lyrics are awesome music's great you know the whole thing and then I read that article where you were like inspired, you know, like you, you would like the same thing. And I was like, that's, that's, it makes so much sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. It, totally. So it's all, but, it, but I, you know, sometimes you read stuff and they misquote you, but is it all true? Did you learn like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, well, I, I grew up, this is like initially metal and then punk and hardcore. And that was my thing. But like, mm -hmm. particularly like thrash is quite hard to play on guitar um, right. when, when you're like 11 and right. teaching yourself <laughs> um, somewhere in a box i still have one of those tab books for for megadeth's i think peace sells who's buying um oh. and i and i still can't play any of it um <laughs> and uh, i was sort of struggling through all of that and then my older sister in the bedroom next to mine was listening to this record that had just come out um august and everything after and like mm. to death and you know, and I had the but I don't know if this was a thing over here, but Bert Whedon's play in a day book, which had like oh, basic board boxes and stuff. There's this some weird old dude called Bert Whedon. Who knows? <laughs> um, but it had it had it had all you know all the basic cowboy chord boxes and stuff. And um, the Cat and Crow stuff, it was like it's it's open chords for the most part. And it was like, well, I can I can do something with this. And I through a process of trial and error for finding the root chords for the songs, I just press play. Play a chord. Oh, it's not that one. <laughs> Stop, <laughs> rewind, do it again. Uh, it's not that one. And then, oh, it's that one. That, that feels pretty good. Um, and basically figured out um, all of the root chords to the whole of that record uh, wow. over the course of about six months. And then shortly thereafter discovered that there was also a kind of a chord tablature book for that album too, which would have saved me a lot of time. <laughs> uh, nice. But, uh, and, and like, not only did that make, give me a sense of accomplishment because I could sort of play the songs, quote unquote, but also mm -hmm. like I would sing them with my sister. Mm. Um, and a really early Doors kind of musical experience for me, which I think uh, has become quite central to the music I make now. It wasn't for a long time when I was playing in hardcore bands, but like essentially I learned how to play these songs and how to play the guitar, but like not to perform to a group of people, but to facilitate the crowd of people in a collective action with, because everybody knew Cat and Crows and yeah. I knew the chords, but it was like, it wasn't like everyone shut up, I'm going to perform this song. It was like, here are the chords, we're all going to sing it together. And, and it, you know, it wasn't, it was a collective activity. And, mm. and I think that that experience, and it started with Crows, but like I went through, you know, Soul Asylum, Weezer, oh, um, nice. know, the, the kind of the, the hits of the early to mid 90s. Um, yeah. Should we say uh, even even in in later times? I'm Eagle Eye Cherry. Yeah, oh so man, I yeah, had that one down. Um, yeah. I would try and throw in like a Get Up Kids song or something every now and again, <laughs> and everyone would be like, "What the hell is this?" Um, <laughs> uh, so I had to kind of stick with stuff that was largely just, and then of course, like Oasis ruined everything for everybody. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> I mean, 
that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> right. But, um, uh, but yeah, so eventually kind of reached a point where, uh, you know, I, 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 would, I had a little repertoire and I could play, but it, it, again, it wasn't a performance to people. It wasn't like everybody shut up. Um, right. Quite the opposite, you know, and there is a part of me that thinks that something of that is kind of like, helped define my musical DNA, or at least the way I think about a good show these days. Mm. You know, obviously, tonight, I'm going to be standing on a raised piece of flooring in, in Richmond, and there will be how many people are in front of me. But like, there is a sense in which it's like, I don't want everyone to like, be silent receptors for what I'm doing. I want right. them to be part of it as well. Well, I've been to one of your so I've uh, early one of your earlier shows, but like there is a sense of strong community that you've developed with your fans. Like, there's no doubt about it. Like when people go to see the show, they do feel like they're a part. You can just feel it in the audience. They feel like they're a part of it. They sing along to everything you're doing. They li- like it's it's really a unique experience. I've been to other I've been to other live perf- yeah I've been to other live performances and stuff like that. But it really is. It kind of leaves you feeling like you know everybody that's there. Yeah, obviously you don't. But it's like you're like, are we all getting together for co- like nobody's going to a diner? Or- <laughs> <laughs> then you realize once it's over, you're all like, oh, all right, I guess that's it. But I've made yeah. friends um, just through through your music and stuff like that, too. Like, I've literally bonded <clears throat> two of my friends. Uh, one of them, um, uh, her name is Ainsley, and I know she's been to a bunch of your concerts. Um, and I think she I think she has a story where she had rushed. She, like, she was texting me. She was in California. You were there. And she just has this great story where she, like, got the sheet, the music sheet, and then, like, somehow managed to rush back to wherever. You know, I don't know how. So I think women have a better uh, – because a guy rushing anywhere, especially one that looks like me, is like, we need to put him down. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> he, he's moving too quickly, and he has yeah, a lot yeah, of air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, but, you know, she got she got back, whatever it was. And she wound up meeting you, and you signed the thing and everything. And it was – but, yeah, we just bonded. We become, like, closer friends just bonding over awesome. your music and stuff. So it's a it's a great community you guys have. Awesome. Thank you. I, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's a funny thing. It's a little bit like a, that, that whole side of things. I sort of, I, I, I'm duty bound to kind of like not concentrate on that part of it too much. Yeah. Otherwise it would become a sats quite quickly. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's yeah. not like, it's not like a fan club where you have to like pay your dues and have a little badge and all that right. kind of thing. But I'm aware obviously that there are, <laughs> there's some pretty big like Facebook groups. And, and I actually, I do send people there for stuff like, you know, trading tickets for sold out shows, they're mm-hmm. great for that. But it goes even beyond that. Like there are people who like, if somebody's traveling internationally for a show, then people will put them up that, yeah. you know, from the group and that kind of thing. And there is a sort of sense of community. That's and I'm cool. so stoked about that and that exists. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, you know, it would be weird if I was too involved in that. It needs. Oh, to, yeah. If I need <laughs> to let my children run free, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, um, I but it, I, I'm very pleased it's that. Do you, when you were starting out and stuff like that, because I've talked to some people who started out over in the UK and they come to America and they both have different receptions where they are. Um, it seems to me from the outside, though, like you, you've got a pretty good reception from home, too. Like, do you, do you feel the same way? Like, do, you, do they um, did they gravitate towards you in the beginning when you started, you know, locally and stuff like that? Yeah, I, I mean... I can sit here and sort of like, um, and I'm about to, to like dissect <laughs> the, the differences between the UK and the US for me. I think that the headline should be that it's that one of the things I enjoy about what I do for a living is that it tends to highlight what people have in common rather than what differentiates them. Nice. That said, I mean, like, in the, it's slightly different because I sort of had my old band had a, in a very, very small underground way, but we had a presence on the UK scene, if you like. And that was sort of a help and a hindrance. Like, it helped me get a lot of shows in the early days, but I was also quite keen not to be the token acoustic guy on the punk rock bill for the rest of my life right, um, right, yeah. when I started out. So there was a degree of distancing that went on there. And there were aspects to like the underground punk scene in the UK that I found pretty an- annoying mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> when I was starting out. Certainly, like I think a lot of people would say that the punk scene such as it is in the UK has always been a lot more kind of waspish and like uh. um, competitive almost, I want to say. And like by contrast when i came to the states i remember like i, I made friends with chuck reagan who got hold of some of my music from hot water music who nice i mean incredible like he's we're now great friends but at the time it was like oh my god um but <laughs> within about a month of meeting chuck i'd met pretty much everybody in every band i'd ever liked when i was a kid oh, you know man. um just because it's a lot over here it feels like the punk scene's a lot more kind of familial you know like mm-hmm. and, and just kind of like everyone's just like there's, a, there's more of a sense of like, I hope you do well, rather than yeah. like, I will crush you um, <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, so, so yeah, there's that. And then also, obviously, the, the, 
for me, coming to America for the first time, there was more kind of a blank slate in terms of what I, whatever I'd done before because Melinda mm-hmm. didn't tour over here. Um, and then also, um, I, uh, I benefit from Anglophilia, which is a thing I was not expecting, but which is mm. very, very real. Um, uh, so, I mean, it's interesting. I love this clash. I love Joe Strummer, but like the way Joe Strummer is talked about in America is like, Ooh, shit. Like you, you guys think he's, he's referred to unironically as St. Joe Strummer over here. Yeah. Like in the, in the UK, he's, yeah, it's Joe Strummer. He was in the class. He was cool. Over here, it's just like, oh. um, and yeah. that, it's, it's just a different thing. And like, you know, having an English accent is, it r- opens a remarkable number of doors in this oh country, my God. Yeah. which is, um, which again is quite weird and not what I was expecting <laughs> when I first came here. Um, you know, so it's, you know, that you do benefit from that. And there's just a lot of kind of, there's a lot of people on the punk scene over here who are, love the clash and Elvis Costello and Billy Bragg and, mm-hmm. and, and all that kind of thing. And, and um, I suppose that kind of, that, that, that benefits me to yeah. over here. I think we're, I think we're just so tired of each other. That anytime something new, like it just, it really is. It's like, oh god, anything new, any, I mean, anything. The same, the same does apply in, in reverse, in the sense that, like, you know, Americans I know who, um, well, I mean, first of all, the entire hardcore punk scene that I grew up with was lived in this sort of like craven awe of American hardcore bands when they come through on tour. Partly because you guys are American and it's just be like they come from the Mystic Land, um, but also. <laughs> And this was actually this was actually quite formative for my career and my thinking about it. It was that like I remember because the thing is the UK hardcore scene in the nineties was so small. There's probably five hundred people in the country who gave a shit. Mm. So you could do like a UK tour would be like six shows. Wow. You know, mm. and, and like that was a pretty thorough coverage mm. um, for the island, as it were. And mm. then like and then these American bands would come through, and I'm talking, you know, I mean, Agnostic Front or Sick of It All or Indecision or yeah. You know, all those kind of bands, or even like slightly smaller bands like like Ensign or Walls of Jericho or that kind of thing, and they'd done three hundred shows last year, and they come through and they would wipe the floor with us. Wow! Um, from just from the point of view of their, their musicality and how tight they were as a band, mm-hmm. and it, for the simple reason they they played more. And like even as a sixteen year old, first going to shows or to hardcore shows, I remember kind of going, "Huh, like <laughs> that's interesting," and I would like to be more like column B than column A kind of thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. Just wanting to tour a lot. I, the, the, this is one of my other grad theories of why of, of American musicality as well, is that your houses are further away from each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you guys can like rehearse in each other's basements and stuff like that in a way that you mm-hmm. cannot do in almost, almost anywhere in England, unless your parents are wealthy and they live in a massive house. I like, thought of it like that. That's so yeah, true. But, but so, I mean, a pretty average middle class family in this country can have kids who can rehearse a heavy hardcore band in their basement. That right. is not true in the UK. Wow. Yeah. I it's never, I never made that connection, but that's really true. That's yeah. crazy. Um, do, do you, do you feel any, cause you have so many albums that are out, right? And you got a new one coming out now. How good are you at moving on from your past work? Or do you still feel like, <laughs> like, do you like <clears throat> not even like playing a touring? I'm thinking like, do you go back and go, you know what? I could tweak that. I can make a little better. I could change a little bit. Or do you go that album's done next album? Oh, uh, well, I mean, I mean, I, I always, uh, T.S. Eliot once said that poetry is never finished. It's only ever abandoned, which I, I, I like. And I yeah. definitely, and I think that's true of most forms of creativity. And one of the sort of practical skills you learn at a certain point is when to just kind of slightly kind of stop analyzing because you can, there's definitely a tipping point beyond which you make it worse. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> by, by continuing to, to edit or alter or whatever. Um, I, I, I in terms of the actual album, I move on from it pretty quickly. Once it's done, I, I generally don't then listen to it for about five years. Um, and like, and I'm actually, I've been having an interesting thing recently. We've been doing kind of 10 year anniversaries of records and we've done 10 year anniversaries of my first four records now because I'm old and I've been doing this for ages. Um, but like, uh, and it's interesting kind of going back and doing the 10 year thing because we've been doing kind of deluxe editions with kind of demos and B-sides and, yeah, you know, all of that kind of good stuff. And um, it's interesting because it's like 10 years is long enough for me to listen to it as a kind of 
more of an objective like outsider do you know what i mean not a hundred percent obviously but it's like i can sort of listen to it with a degree of detachment Mm -hmm. um which is nice because it means that i'm not trying to second guess how it goes or worrying about how the kick drum sounds or you know whatever it might be and it's been quite pleasant to kind of go huh you know this is kind of cool though like i like this but that isn't yet true of like records from within the last like five years those ones still make me want to kind of like headbutt my laptop into smithereens or whatever <laughs> um but but you know like i mean on a practical level once the record's finished it's like cool done move forward um also i mean the other thing i would say is that generally speaking in my career like if i've made a record that i'm happy with which has happened a few times but not often and that's quite often a moment of kind of like that's, that can be a creative turning point for me it's like mm-hmm. cool that went well now do something else do you know what i mean rather than yeah, like, gotcha. fine tune that thought process with the next record it's like that was great which means now i'm gonna go over that way right um, yeah so do you do you think like england keep my bones was like that for you because i remember when that yeah, came definitely. out okay yeah. great because that's what that's exactly what i got from it when i when i first heard that record it was fucking awesome thank you i mean that was a record where i sort of felt like i had done that thing mm-hmm. that, um as well as i was likely to do it and therefore right. but i mean it's kind of interesting i mean all of this now feels like a lifetime ago because it was but like you know when we did take that cart there was a whole bunch of people who were like well where are all the songs about england and it was like that was that was was one album like chill out and then and then after and then people asked me where all the breakup songs have gone after in records post take deck and all this and it's just it's like it's not the hardest concept to grasp that i might that i might sort of deal with one issue for a time and then yeah how are you? Uh, how are you at doing that kind of like? Do you set off to make an album in a particular way? Because I know that something either, like, if you're writing songs, we've talked to a lot of people that either go, you know, I hear music first, I write everything li- musically, and then a few of them, not as many as I thought, do it lyrically first. Do you set uh, off as a theme though, or what's your kind of? MO? I mean, the first thing I would say is I try quite hard not to pre-direct, um, okay. uh, you know, and to be quite naturalistic about my songwriting, and like I don't want to sound too much like a hippie. But like, you know, it's things arrive at the time of their own choosing. I don't yeah. have any set process for writing per se. And like, I would say that generally speaking, I have a pile of kind of lyrical ideas that interest me or uh, linguistic ideas almost, I want to say. Mm-hmm. It can be yeah. as much as just sort of a thought or an idea or a subject or a turn of phrase, um, you know, and that, there's just kind of a notepad part of that. And then there's kind of a pile of musical ideas over here. And quite often the sort of grunt work of writing is picking up one from one and one from the other. It's a bit kind of junkyard and just doing this for a bit. Nice. Seeing gotcha. if anything sparks. Um, right. From time to time, a musical and lyrical idea sort of arrives combined. And that's usually something good. It's like, aha, yes, good. Onwards with you. Um, but you know, it's like, I mean, I have endless voice notes on my phone of literally just like, it can be like 10 seconds of a guitar figure that feels kind of nice to me. And, you know, similarly just, um, uh, you know, it can be a couple of, and, and quite often they take years to find their home. There's a line in a um, song called haven't been doing so well from the new record, which yeah. is, um, if self-loathing was a sport, I'd be Muhammad Ali. Uh, <laughs> and, and like that, some, it wasn't even that it was something along those lines mm-hmm. that's been mm-hmm. sort of jotted in a notebook for about a decade. And it was just waiting for its moment. Oh, and that nice. wasn't even where that song started. I got halfway through that song and was just like, I often feel like your bridge is the bit that sorts the sheep from the goats. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's all very well having a verse and a chorus, but where are you taking your middle eight, motherfucker? Um, and, <laughs> and, um, and I was just kind of rifling through notepads. This is quite often, this will be part of the process is just if I reach an impasse, you just kind of flip back through old thoughts and old jottings. And I found, saw that one and went, that's already what I'm talking about. Nice. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like that's yeah. how, finally home you know um yeah because i know we, like during the uh pandemic and the lockdown and stuff like that you know you were doing some streaming stuff and now yeah. you're back uh, <laughs> I, I know all of it was yeah, yeah. we all yeah, we yeah. all dabbled in a little I, I, I did i did too many live streams i think yeah it was, it was to <laughs> anyway um but i mean like so w- w- how are you are you juggling that right now because i feel like that, that was a lot of the things that people struggled with it was like you know they started doing all this shit when to survive beforehand and entered into new venues this kind of thing you know whatever it is and then now that their normal quote-unquote lives are starting back up again are you mashing the two together have you abandoned have you been able to abandon the other thing or are you Um, trying to balance it no i mean my my initial hope was to never ever live stream anything ever again as long as i lived (laughs) um 
I mean, you know, it was a necessary. Um, yeah. I don't say evil, but it you know it was it was a uh, it was a. Uh, uh, you could uh, say it. It well, it made sense at the time because there were no other options for communication, and right. and I'm grateful that it was an option when when required and all that. But at the same time, like uh, you know, it's a sax and it was a it was a stop gap and it was a cover as far as I was concerned. My initial mm. thought was that like yeah, I never want to do a live stream again, and between now and the, the day I die, goddamn it, but. <laughs> My, my thinking on that was slightly altered. I mean, first of all, there are people for various valid reasons who, for whom coming back to a show is still not quite an option, whether right. that's to do with their own long-term health conditions or if they're a carer for somebody who has long-term health conditions or whatever, you know. Um, and I do think that, like, I don't want to, like, permanently exclude those kind of people from what yeah. I do. So we kind of took this view that we were going to... So we've actually done it already. We live-streamed the show from Philadelphia... Nice. um a couple of nights ago um you know we picked one show of the tour which mm -hmm. was um and and we live streamed that one and you know hopefully that gives people the opportunity to kind of engage with it who who aren't able to come but at the same time like it wasn't like a special event away from that because the other the other thing of course is that the format of live streaming is very different from doing an actual show because there's no exchange of energy there's no direct communication because you're in separate rooms Absolutely. so li live streaming an actual show make a fair amount of sense to me Oh yeah, yeah. Um, is it? Uh, I gotta ask you because I remember the first episode we talked about this a lot. Uh, but how's your relationship with Sky Mall? <laughs> Has it held up? Uh, you know what? I, I don't actually. I'm, I'll be honest with you. I'm not 100 percent sure what the state of Sky Mall currently is. Oh. Um, it very nearly went under a few years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because about a million people sent me a link to the thing that they were trying to crowdfund. Sky Mall fans were trying to crowdsource <laughs> buying the company. Um, wow. which I didn't get involved in. But and did you ever get the big slippers? Because we were talking about, like that. No, the... I did. I think I, I, I do remember us talking about this. I did get one of the gigantic Easter Island heads sent to my American. Oh, yeah. just, oh uh, that's great! I tell you, it was it was it was the it was an excellent like roast or whatever. Like it was, we were on tour. It was a guy who used to tour manage me. He's now tour manager's Flog and Molly, and we were touring oh, no. with Flog and Molly, and. You know, he has a busy time tour managing that band. And mm -hmm. the last day of the tour is always hectic because as a tour manager, part of his job is to deal with where all the equipment goes after the last show. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. As well as yeah. where all the people go. Um, so I had a eight foot tall Easter Island head shipped to the final venue of the tour addressed to him <laughs> um, with no further explanation <laughs> attached to it. And um, so he arrived at the venue and was told that there was a delivery waiting for him which is pretty normal for a tour manager that would happen i mean he's a bit like and he's like what if i ordered it's the last day of the tour probably <laughs> and then he was like you son of a bitch um <laughs> but it's now in his fire pit in his garden um, oh that's nice. lovely yeah he i was gonna say did he get it back to wherever he, he was he supposed did, to he go? Did. <laughs> and thankfully it was already packed in a in a crate so uh that's pretty know. great yeah oh that's hilarious yeah, I was wondering if they survived the pandemic or not. And I can't, it's one of those things that we had talked about it like so much that like it just stuck in my head. And I was like <laughs> thinking about it like nonstop. And then like all of a sudden, you know, when like you don't think about anything and then somebody puts it in your head and you see it everywhere yeah, yeah, yeah. after that. And you're like, has it always been here? Is the universe just tossing? It was it was one of those situations where I was sure. like, God damn it, Frank Turner. <laughs> well, we you know what? We are driving most of this 50 states tour, but I am flying okay. to Alaska. Um, and back yeah. again. So I will be checking out to see if there's any Sky Mall action. Nice. nice. Is there, am I allowed to ask you what your favorite is or are you not supposed to do it while you're on tour? My favorite state? Yeah, yeah. Your favorite place to perform in the US. Today it's Richmond, Virginia. Yeah. yeah. Richmond, yeah. <laughs> we have fans waiting to see him tonight that are chatting. Yeah, my, 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 play, my favorite place to play is insert your state here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know, like, I mean, I will say, like, with the bit I'm almost most excited about on this tour is getting to um, uh, this place I haven't been. So, so before ahead of this tour, I had I was missing three states, oh, which wow. is Wyoming, South Dakota, and Hawaii. And my booking agent did at one point be like, "We could just do three shows, and then you would have your full 50. Wow! And I said, "Ah, no fun." <laughs> Um, and now I'm sitting here thinking, wow, that would have been a great idea for a tour. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I'm looking forward to going to those three states because, uh, that will be new 
territory nice. for me. I mean, uh, we're finishing Hawaii, which sounds delightful. However, at that point, I'm going to be exhausted and wanting to go home. So I'm not really hanging around yeah. very much, alas. But right. um, uh, but I'm looking forward to those two. That's awesome. And Richmond, of course. And, and yes, and of course, Richmond, Virginia. What, where is your show tonight in Richmond? Uh, it's at the National in Richmond, Virginia. Very nice. Um, which is a delightful spot. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great, yeah, it's a great place. Um, I got some are, questions too with the, with all the travel. The uh, so now, are you in a big bus or are you? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. We're on a big tour bus. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, my hat goes. I about to say my hat goes out to, which isn't quite. That's two metaphors, two sayings being mixed up. <laughs> my, my my hat gets taken off for my crew, my my um, manager, booking agent, production manager, and tour manager, because essentially, like everyone's like, "Wow, I must have taken so much work to organize this tour," and I'm like, "Yeah, probably." Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> I came up with the idea and just kind of, I just sort of vomit ideas into a, my cupped hands and pass them. <laughs> <laughs> to my crew who then go jesus christ and figure it all out um and there's some i mean some a fair amount of this tour is reasonably normal but just quite long um there are some sticky parts uh, the dakotas are quite far away from everything else and each other yeah. Yeah. um so yeah. that part's going to be interesting mm -hmm. um and as then, they should be no i'm just kidding mm. <laughs> <laughs> Dakotas, and like and the, the first the first stretch of this tour was pretty brutal because the thing is like i'm not playing every single day 50 days my boys can take that yeah. so in the northeast we did a lot of two show days because that buys me a day off if you see what i mean mm -hmm. um so we did we did 11 shows in seven days at the top of this tour um wow. which uh which was brutal um wow. and in fact i mean right now i'm doing six shows in the next five days including tonight um but you know there is a once once we kind of get into the middle it's a pretty regular tour to be honest oh cool gotcha that is very yeah. cool and That's then awesome. you have favorite spots to eat and stop along the way like have you picked <laughs> those up because me and john usually is this the yeah most people. yeah i mean i do i mean so one of the fun things of this tour is that um the drummer in my band callum it's his uh it's his first tour in america with us he joined the band 18 months ago and indeed his first ever trip to america and like me um, and the rest of everybody else we've all been around this country a lot in the past and it's really nice having somebody seeing it with fresh eyes you know that gives yeah. us a kind of a uh, um a fresh perspective on it all and so one of the first things that we taught him and, and the next few days will be crucial to this is that um what was historically known as the mason dixon line uh is of course now known as the ihop waffle house line so um <laughs> uh, uh we've taken him to an ihop which incidentally is a chain that should be called hop because <laughs> There are, as I think, I th I'm told there's one in Canada. Yeah. But otherwise, it is a national, or maybe, maybe NHOP. It's a national house of pancakes. Um, uh, but uh, so we took him to an IHOP and it was glorious. It was like pretty much on like the second day of the tour. And he was like, oh, I'll get that. And then this is like yeah. fucking half a house of food arrived. Right. Um, but in the next couple of days, as and when it's doable, we're going to take him to a Waffle House. And if oh, I had to choose between IHOP and Waffle House, I would choose Waffle House. Yeah, absolutely. They have, has good I, I know it's going to kill me. I know it's going to kill me, but I'm, oh, yeah. I'm ready for that. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a – you know, I felt the same way when they tried to uh, – I don't know. There was some kind of – I don't know if you had this or heard this or if you were in the States yet, but they were boycotting Pizza Hut. You know, it was the, it was the if you go woke, you go broke thing. So, like, all the conservatives were like – because Pizza Hut does that reading program thing where they were like uh – -huh. You know, uh, if kids read a certain amount of books and one of the books they're recommending is about a, you know, a kid who wants to be a drag queen. So, of course, conservatives lost their mind and then wanted to ban Pizza Hut. I'm I'm 37. I haven't had Pizza Hut in God knows how long, but I was like, I will eat Pizza Hut every day <laughs> <laughs> in spite yeah. of what it's yeah, going yeah. to do to my intestines now. Right. Uh, well, the, the flip side of that for me, actually, was that I was introduced many, um, probably five years ago to Chick-fil-A. And Chick Fil A makes some fantastic chicken, and they really do. It, yeah. and then it was after that that I was then informed about the broader political perspectives of, um, to put it <laughs> in a generous yeah. way, um, of, of Chick Fil A, which was a real sadness for me because I um, completely agree. They make they are really really tasty chicken, but unfortunately, it's not for me. Yeah, uh, but I mean, generally speaking, my my dining choices are governed by what is nearest the venue uh, and what approximates closest to health. <laughs> um have you been do you do you binge stuff when you're on the road are you are you pretty good in the like the tour bus stuff like that what have you been uh, uh yeah i mean i've been and i read a lot um 
uh, I, I do, I mean, I, I was pinning, what did I, the first day off of this tour, I watched the entirety of the final se season of Piggy Binders and then passed out. It was amazing. So, um, yeah. uh, but I read a lot as well. Um, uh, what am I reading at the moment? I just finished uh, a book about postmodernism. Um, oh. And I have a book by Thomas Nagel that I'm going to start shortly. And nice. um, a lot of history books and stuff like that. So yeah, I, 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 I read a lot. That's awesome. Uh, if you did, you watch Stranger? Do you watch Stranger Things? Are you a fan? You know, I watched two episodes yesterday. Oh, you did. Nice. Yeah. Uh, well, so, in fact, if I'm allowed to have an opinion about Stranger Things, I thought the first season was absolutely phenomenal from top to yeah. bottom, and I yeah. thought that seasons two and seasons three were a little bit like the later period Matrix films in the sense that it was somebody who kind of stumbled across an incredible idea and then didn't really know what to do with it. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. And and I mean, I, you know, I, I still think that the first season was good enough that I'm going to watch season four, and I am now watching it. But right. it's just. There was sometimes, you know, that there was such kind of like purpose to that first season. It had a direction, it had a narrative arc, and it just sort of made sense. Mm -hmm. um, and it was original and all this kind of thing. And, uh, you know, sometimes there are, there are TV shows that I think that could stand to just be one season, and that would be okay. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Well, they're doing that now with like, I mean, and I, you know, I love all the Star Wars stuff or whatever, but I really noticed that like, you know, they'll pump out these series or whatever, and they're eight episodes long, and the story cannot fill eight episodes. Well, can I ruin my career quickly? Yes, please. Yes, yeah, stop, <laughs> stop fucking caring about Star Wars. <laughs> It was it was it was it was three possibly good adolescent movies in the nineteen seventies and eighties. Yeah, like and every like, guitar tech in my band is like a diehard Star Wars fan who has been disappointed by absolutely every single thing apart from the first three films. Yes, and it's like it's it's like how many times does did you need to get like beaten before you kind of accept that Star Wars doesn't love you? Like, I know. It, it's just like it's just it it yeah. happened like when you were a child. It's and so it's, bad, man. Yeah. If, like, if you could have freeze fr framed the the shot when you said that to John, you could see his heartbreak. But <laughs> it's fucking true, and you know it's true in your I heart. Do. And like, and my guitar like, he's like, "Oh, well, Rogue One's good," and I'm like, "Cool, that's like one out of like fifteen <laughs> things they've done since." I'm not going to invest my time. And it like, and it, you know, I enjoyed the first three, and the sure yeah. the story's kind of imprinted on my brain partly because of how old I am. But like, it's yeah. not, yeah. it's not fucking Tolstoy. Right. You know what I mean, it's, 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 like, it's not, it's not like important to me. It's just right. a plot I remember because I saw it when I was like six. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you're you're absolutely right. And I don't know. It, I was sitting there watching it last night because I was like, oh, because okay, uh, oh God, I'm not defending anything. I watched Mandalorian. I really. No, yeah, I mean, you, you can defend you're it. You're allowed to. No, you're right. Be, be wrong. You can tell me I'm wrong about this. You're not it's wrong. Totally but fine. here's the thing. You're not wrong because I was just because when you said your your buddy was like Rogue One was good and that's the one I whatever. I was in my brain going, ah, oh, I could get him with by saying Mandalorian was great. But yeah, it was one one season of a show. But like, yeah. but then I'm sitting there. But also, literally... also, well, if we're gonna get deeper into this, by the way, well, one of the things that annoys me about Star Trek is the fact that what's great about science fiction is that literally anything could happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yet, at least I think I'm not exaggerating by saying that on the fourth time of trying, oh, there was a fucking huge machine with an air vent that they flew in and fucking, do you know what I mean? It's just like <laughs> literally anything in all of you, not just in reality. In all, of, Ian Banks famously started writing science fi books under Ian M. Banks because reality was too constrained for his imagination. I think it's absolutely amazing, and I adore his books. And yeah. like, it's just kind of like, cool. I mean, anything at all could happen in the Star Wars universe. But right. it's fucking the Ewoks and the air vents again. Like, know, yeah. just <laughs> Christ. Hey, no, it's um, like they're literally like the last couple movies were like somebody had an IP list, and they were like, all right, what are we checking off here? And then somebody just went select all, and then they just threw yeah, every. But that's it. I watched the I watched the episode. Uh, hold on. Nine, I suppose it would be the first oh, of the kind of new ones. I went, I went yeah. to see it like with my nephew, who, in fairness, really enjoyed it because he was nine. <laughs> um, but like, and, and but it was just a bit kind of like it just made me think of kind of like comic book guy from The Simpsons. And it's like they were desperate not to piss him off. Yeah, and it was just kind of like you know what would have been amazing would be make a new Star Wars film that didn't make any fucking reference to like yeah yeah yeah, and just had all new aliens and all new worlds and all this kind of thing. I think that's what they, they gave it to Taika Waititi, who I love, uh, who mm. I think has done a bunch of great shit. So and he was like, I'm not using like he's, he's like if I'm gonna make Star Wars shit, like it's gonna be no, I'm not using anybody that anybody knows. It's all gonna be new. Mm -hmm. So hopefully they do some of that. But like even then, it's like sometimes you're like, why not just make a new space movie? There's so many other sci-fi. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What do you have to 
do it yeah. under that moniker for it. It's fucking right. weird. Yeah. yeah, it's just like, I mean, it's, it is the most, well, I was going to say it's the most damaged brand, but it ultimately it's the most resilient brand ultimately because everybody's right. still fucking yeah. obsessed with this thing that has thus far, far got a score of three yeah. <laughs> out, of, <laughs> out of a million. And even that's slightly debatable about Jedi, come on. Oh God. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I thought. I, I mean, you know what I loved? I love. I like Ryan Johnson a lot, especially as a, just a director in general. The Knives Out was fucking amazing, uh, mm. and I thought he had a really good like. Like it looked like the the franchise was finally going to go in a different direction because he really kind of opened it up and did a bunch of shit that pissed off like the normal fan, like all that other crap. But like it was a great film. And then like Disney chickened out, and they were like, "Can we can we bring in the mediocre guy to bring back all the shit we like?" <laughs> and then like that was that was just fucking it. I, um, I think this is a perfect segue to let our audience in with us to ask some questions. So if you're yes. out there and you have some questions, yeah. because I'm, I'm about to get stabbed by Star Wars fans. Well, it, like, it, it split the crowd. Jackie, who's seeing you tonight, says, I agree, Star Wars is overrated. And the more said, no worries, Pove, the force is with you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ultimately, ultimately, and, and like this is this is okay, let, let me broaden this out and make this more philosophical. One of the things I've learned as I've got older is it is such a waste of time being annoyed that people have different tastes to you. Mm -hmm. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, if people like Star Wars, I, that makes me happy, and I hope that the Star Wars makes more films that makes them happy. It's yeah. like it's like the music of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. It's not for me, but every morning the Red Hot Chili Peppers <laughs> wake up and make up, make Red Hot Chili Peppers fans happy, and I think that's good, and I hope they do that more. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I feel the same way about ventriloquists. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I feel <laughs> the same it. way. Yeah. Yeah, you know, if, if there's somebody making something. Putting some kind of art out into the world that makes some any other group of people happier, then I yeah. hope they do more of it. Ultimately, absolutely. Jackie said she discovered you while she was uh, seeing the Counting Crows, and awesome. she should see you again tonight. Fantastic. She was just wondering if you were able to travel. Uh, oh, how how I'm able to travel? Um, yeah. Well, so we have a we have a complicated thing going on. So basically. Let's get specific. The tour bus has to kind of travel overnight to where it's going to be for the evening show each day. Um, I've only got the one show today, so you know we drove overnight uh, from New Jersey. In fact, we had the day off yesterday. Oh, no. um, but uh, um, sorry, hold on. Uh, but so um, and then uh, on the day. So for example, in two days time, I I'm doing Charlotte in the evening, uh, but I'm doing uh, West Columbia, South Carolina in the afternoon. So I'm going to wake up in Charlotte and then my buddy Craig is going to be there with a uh, hire car and we're going to jump in the hire car and drive oh, to okay. West Columbia, South Carolina and then turn around and then drive back in. And um, wow. yeah, so that's how that's going to work. So it's it's a pretty, pretty crazy logistical un undertaking. Do you need two sets of equipment? Do they take one and set up the other one while you're performing at the previous show? So the, um, so the, the daytime shows are generally solo shows. Gotcha. So the full band equipment get, but that's part of the reason why the bus has to arrive um, uh, um, at the evening venue is because it takes all day to set up a, a full band show with the amps and the drums and blah blah blah. Yeah, um, one right. of the advantages of what I do is that it's flexible. You know, I can I can play on my own. Or tomorrow night we're in Huntington, West Virginia, and uh, Mr. Matt Nazir and I will be playing a duo show. Um, so you know, it switches up um, from show to show. Sweet, very cool, very um, very cool. And can I hit him with the big three yet? Or, oh, okay. No, I got plenty. No, I'm sorry. They, they were coming in. So no, no, Scuba coming. Pudding Girl was asked, what are Frank's vocal warm-up and cool-down techniques? Uh, I mean, we'll be here for a long time if we get hard into it. But uh, <laughs> I do a lot of steaming um, uh, of my voice. I have like a, a throat steamer thing, um, which is terribly cool and punk. Um, <laughs> and uh, I do a lot of that. And then kind of like... Um, uh, drinking throat coat and then kind of various kind of scales and, and workout exercises and all this kind of thing um you know and then a fair amount of hope <laughs> uh, i mean this is a you know we're doing i mean at the headline the evening shows i'm doing two hours and during the daytime i'm generally doing an hour it's it's pretty hard going on this yeah. run wow that is pretty strenuous the more said uh, my man frank just my mom yeah my man frank just became a huge fan the earth is flat good tune well thank you that was one from a record i did with my buddy john snowgrass uh buddies two um uh we're talking about doing buddies three although thus the buddies one and buddies two had 10 years between them so we we're going to do buddies three in oh, 2030. Wow. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you uh, uh the, the thing with those records is that we write them in a day uh, wow. So uh, we did, uh, and uh, I, of course, I don't actually think the earth is flat for anyone who hasn't heard that song and is wondering. <laughs> <laughs> and let me see that. So Jackie also said she would like to know if you'll be performing tattoos at the Richmond show tonight. 
Oh, well, let me see what I can do. I've had a fair few um, uh, requests for this evening, but Jackie, I will leave it with me. Oh, that was nice. Very nice. How nice that you're tuning into Dystopia. This is our first time on Dystopia, she mentioned earlier, actually, in the chat. Oh, thanks and for joining in. Engage with, right? Thanks for joining us in our little Dystopia over here. Uh, uh, any more? Uh, yes, let me check. Well, the more she covered it about about that tune and release. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Oh, Ali had asked, he asked if you had gotten your 100,000 play <laughs> button from YouTube yet because there's 105,000 <laughs> yeah. followers. Yeah, there's, I, I've got a. So I, I have a nephew who's now 13, who's very sweet, but he's very into kind of stats, should we yeah. say. And a couple of years ago, and he's got a phone now, and he texted me and he said, Uncle Frank, I hear that when you get 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, you get, a, you get an award. Is that true? And I said, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> and he texted me back and said, well, you have 98,000 followers. Why don't you get 2,000 more and tell me? And I said, <laughs> okay. Okay, I will. I mean, like, um, and, and so, so and, I mean, I, I don't quite know I, I, how one gets more subscribers on YouTube. I just sort of continued doing what I do. And, uh, and we got the 100,000 thing. And I did. And you do get an award. And <laughs> well, wow. so I mean, I'm not disavowing it in any way. I'm very pleased with it. It's a slightly kind of esoteric thing to have an award for. Mm -hmm. But it is hilariously shitloads bigger than any of the other awards <laughs> I've ever received. It's really big. So, like, I've got, like... I've got like kind of in spirit of independence Kerrang award. I've got the independent music. I've got three awards from them. I've got like, you know, I've got a number one record award and all this kind of thing. And they all look great on my shelf. And then there's this hundred thousand YouTube. Which is like, <laughs> it's a huge steel slab. Um, oh my God. But you know, fuck it. It's cool. It looks good on the shelf, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that That's incredible. The, uh, our Castro said there's plenty of IHOPs in Mexico. So that, that's, that's the that? You know what? This is fantastic. I wow. stand corrected. I stand educated. <laughs> All right. IHOP fans it. coming in swinging. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I love it. Don't get me wrong. I like I, I like IHOP. But Waffle House, the reason Waffle House edges it, aside from the fact that they're pretty they're more kind of like um open about the fact they're trying to kill you, um, is the fact that um is the jukeboxes. Do you know about the jukeboxes? Yes, Waffle House? absolutely. So in the 1960s, basically anybody who couldn't get signed to Stacks or Motown or those soul groups that would record songs about waffles mm -hmm. and they would get put on the waffle house jukeboxes and they're still there and it's absolutely sensational because yeah, wow. you know even the, a lot of these were really quite excellent soul r&b bands from the 1960s kind of like my grits are cooking down at the waffle house mm -hmm. it's yeah. awesome yeah. i might do an album of waffle house songs oh that'd be great <laughs> that would be great that would be awesome now you're gonna have the people demanding it yeah. seeing uh, this right. question in front of me right now um yeah. uh from uh our, our caster show our caster show yep. Is that yeah our cast show i don't know um thank you for the question um I, I mean yes absolutely and in a way i feel like a song that changes its meaning for me over the years that seems like a good sign to me in the sense that um it, the song has some kind of flexibility if you see what i mean like i think that a song that is just about one thing and and has no room for interpretation i mean i have a lot of songs like that don't get me wrong but like yeah. I'm almost more interested, you know, when when somebody comes up to me and says, well, this song you wrote means this to me. And I'm like, huh, wow, okay. Like, right. and that's good, you know, and, and, and sometimes people worry if their interpretation of one of my songs doesn't chime with mine. I'm like, no, 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 that's, that's great. That's how it should be. The song means whatever you think it means, ultimately. Nice. Um, and there are, I'm the, the most obvious example to me that I have a song called I Am Disappeared, which I, I could be honest, find it quite difficult to remember exactly what it was thinking about when I wrote it, but it's, it's definitely, I wrote that song probably 12 years ago yeah. um and it means radically different things to me now to, wow. to what it meant then and i think that's and indeed changes night on night and i think that's cool that is cool that is really cool and i love that as an artist you embrace other people's like oh yeah of yeah yeah where there's a there's a there's a guy somewhere in in europe i, I don't want to be too specific about this but he's got this like serious like conspiracy theory like cork board with bits of string theory that like all of my songs are like about one very small group of people and that this name and this song is that person and that song and that that song feeds into wow. that song and la 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 and he did tell me about it once after the show and i was like you are 100 percent correct wow <laughs> <laughs> that's just great waved him on his way yeah yeah right <laughs> that is pretty amazing Excellent. so 
We appreciate everybody out there asking all the questions, but I know uh, I know we don't want to keep you too long. But John, yeah. you want to hit him with big. So three we didn't too? have this last time you were on. So we we've been asking oh, okay. every guest the same three questions. Um, so the first one is: uh, if you can go back in time, talk to your younger self, what piece of advice would you give yourself today? Stretch. Stretch. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I, 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 in all honesty, I think that 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 I, the, the the problem with that question is that like learning by doing is the best way of learning anything. So yeah. generally speaking, I don't want to like preempt any of the things I, I have regrets i have bad decisions i've made and all the rest mm -hmm. of it but like you know um i don't want to kind of get into sort of second guessing any of that but i right. wish i'd stretched more when i was younger yeah because because right. it fucking hurts hurting your back injuring your back um wow. and so there we go that's Great. a good answer and i feel yeah. like i agree like learning from doing i don't think i've ever i don't really have regrets as much as i have like learning experiences as long as right. i can right. take it in as a learning experience it's all right not too yeah. much um especially I, no one's ever said how weird it would be for an older man to show up at a younger kid's like playground and shake the shit out of them and tell them not to do something like, just the traumatizing like no well, time to explain yeah i would probably then do that thing yeah exactly like, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, be like fuck you weird old man with too yeah. many tattoos <laughs> <laughs> uh second question is what had to end in your life good or bad that led you to where you are today what what had to end i mean yeah. uh oof, i mean Many things. Um, uh, I mean, I suppose I could talk about um, uh, my, my, I had issues with substance abuse for a long time. And like, the, I'm always haunted by a line from the Hold Steady where Craig wrote the, the lyric, it started recreational and ended kind of medical. It oh, definitely yeah. started out as fun and then wasn't fun um, and was a real issue in my life. And it, it is currently in my rearview mirror. I think that anybody who has any kind of addiction issues knows that that's a, a continual ongoing process. Um, but uh, I certainly, it definitely reached a point where I wasn't going to be here in any shape or form unless I did something about it. So wow. there we go. Yeah, Great. Well, that's good. Uh, and the last question ties in with the show. Uh, it's kind of goofy. Uh, if this is a genuine dystopia, more so than it is now, it could be aliens or zombies or a comet heading toward Earth, but it's everybody's last day. Uh, how would you want to go out? What would be your epic death? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, uh, this is a, that's a difficult question in a lot of different ways because, I mean, on the, you know, I'd want to spend it with my wife uh, um, for sure. I mean, mm -hmm. on the flip side, I don't want to make this a heavy answer to the question, but in all <laughs> seriousness, if I knew the world was going to end tomorrow, a big part of me would want to get high. Um, nice. But, because like, uh, and that's the thing I spend a lot of my life trying not to do anymore. Right. But like, if, yeah. if if there were no further consequences, I'd be like, fuck it, man, let's get really fucked up. Um, there's not, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know. Like, there's a part of me that wouldn't want to know and just carry on. Yeah, do you know what I mean? I think. Well, I like. What that would too. you want it to be? Would you want it to be an alien invasion? Would you want to be zombie? Like, what kind of supernatural shit would you want to get high during? Oh, I mean. I... <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't I kind of I think I'm more into the like the meteor type situation. All right. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, uh, the, I think that zombie films just go on and on and on. I like and I certainly like I feel like if I realized that I was in like a kind of day of the dead type situation, I would run open arm towards the zombies because <laughs> the people who survive for a long time don't have a good time. Right. Yeah. You know what right. I mean? It's not it's not it's not a good life that the right. people in The Walking Dead season no. six are living. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Not like, even on yeah. the set. Yeah, and it's like, so I'd just be like, oh, it's what, it's the zombie, cool, uh, bye. <laughs> you know? Hilarious, like, man. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for doing this, man. Thanks for coming back with us. I appreciate it. My yeah, pleasure. Man. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, maybe we'll do it again sometime. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Oh, I wish I wish we would have known when you were up in the New Jersey one. That was my fault. I was in I was in Vegas, but that would have been a cool one to go check you out. We're gonna have to try and travel to one of these other states when you get in the. Well, we are we are doing all of them. So, yeah. uh... <laughs> John, I'm gonna try and convince John to do one that we haven't uh, seen that we haven't seen. Maybe you haven't seen. I'll get him to South oh, Dakota or something. A state. Okay. I was gonna say I was like I was like we just trashed the Dakotas. Uh, well, now I, you have I, to go and apologize. I, That's <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I'll do that. Uh, dude, thanks so much, man. Have a good time. Such a pleasure, you. man. Yeah, thanks. Have a great Thank one tonight. Guys. Peace. Bye. -bye. Dystopia tonight.